speaks from there. Uh, in fact, I don't think that there's ever been a speaker that we've had that people have come up to me and said they really enjoyed that. I really want when she coming back more than Bonnie Gordon, our speaker today, and we just love her. Thanks for coming. Oh, so I'm hooked up here. Yes. Uh -huh. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. I'm on. Oh, I'm sorry. You're on. Mm -hmm. oh, wasn't Asia amazing? She's gone now. Yes. <laughs> she made me cry. So, anyways, uh, I'm very grateful and honored to be here today. And thank you, Sandra and Unity, for inviting me to speak today. And thank you, all of you, all my friends and loved ones that are here today. I appreciate and honor and love you all. And I wanted to start with a question. Has anybody had anything happen in your life that seemed really bad, but after time? <laughs> thrust, just thrust. <laughs> but after time unraveled and more information was revealed, you realized that that was actually for the best. Has anyone had that happen? Well, that happened to me many times, but one time in particular, I was... <laughs> Should I use the thing? Okay. I was nine years old. <clears throat> I was nine years old. And my dad decided to take the whole family to Disney World. So all six of us piled into the Winnebago, and it was a 24-hour drive from Massachusetts to Disney World, Florida, and we were about one minute down the road, and my brother hollered from the very back of the Winnebago, and he said, Dad, are we there yet? <laughs> and my dad realized this just may be a very long drive. <laughs> but we split it up into two days, and on the last day, we got such an early start that my dad told us all we would get into Disney World in time to go to Disney World. It was our very first time. We were so excited. We were having a happy party in the Winnebago. <laughs> and then a few hours down the road, my dad announced to all of us that he had made a wrong turn. A wrong turn that was going to cost us the day in Disney World that day. Well, our happy party turned into a pity party. <laughs> but my dad said something really strange. He said, don't worry, kids, because everything happens for the best. Well, really, when you're nine years old and your dad makes a wrong turn that costs you the day in Disney World, it's really difficult to see how that could be for the best. Actually, I didn't believe my dad. I thought he was wrong. But he continued to chant it all the way to Disney World. Everything happens for the best. We did get to Disney. We got to the campground. We went swimming and we had a cookout. And then the next morning at breakfast, I heard a very melodious tone, very familiar melodious tone. It was my dad coming around the corner saying, everything happens for the best. He had a big beaming smile on his face. And he went on to tell us all that on his morning walk, he had met a man who had gone the right way and got stuck in traffic for hours and hours on the hot Florida highway and didn't get into the campground till midnight that night. My nine-year-old brain was scrambling. I mean, what I couldn't have imagined could have been true a moment ago it was true. Sitting on a hot Florida highway, six people crammed in Winnebago till midnight while coming to the campground and going swimming, having a cookout. My dad was right. Everything did happen for the best. But how do we know if this is true? The universe. I mean, we look out into the world and there is still poverty, crime, disease. There's still war. 
Watch the news. But what the news doesn't tell us is that there are billions and billions of human beings all around this globe that work every day to make this world a better place. Ministers, doctors, counselors, teachers, and not just the helping professions. What about the truck driver that delivers our food to the supermarket so we can eat? Or the construction worker that builds roads and builds our homes? What about all the people behind the scenes on telephones, making sure our medical bills are paid, making sure our credit cards are processed? <laughs> Sandra doesn't like them. Processing credit cards. <laughs> so our purchases can come through. Well, I have a daughter who's behind the scenes. I had to include her. What about the people that work at the telephone company and make sure our internet is up and our phones are working? How? Good would our lives work if we had no internet or no phone for a couple weeks? Oh. <laughs> and there's, there's also billions and billions of people that volunteer every day out of the goodness of their heart, selflessly, for no other reward but to give and to help another person. This world is bursting full and overflowing with good, decent, kind, loving people. But still, how do we know that it's true? How do we know my dad is right, that everything always happens for the best? I mean, we've all had those experiences where it didn't look like it. And there was a time in my life where it didn't look like it at all. It was in 2008, and it's when my soulmate passed away. And I was experiencing tremendous grief. And I had legal issues and financial issues and teenage children issues, and everything in my life seemed to be falling apart, and it did not look like it was in divine right order. Not at all. And so I asked myself this question, I don't know if I believe this. I believed my dad my whole life, but I questioned him. And I set out on a quest to answer this question for myself. Is this a chaotic, random, fearful and threatening universe? Or is this a divinely orchestrated, friendly and safe universe? Well, it took me several months to ask this question. And I want to invite each and every one of you to ask this question yourself. You don't have to take as long as I took. <laughs> but I want to suggest that you don't ask your five senses in your brain. You see, when our all-loving, infinite, all-knowing, divine awareness decided to have a physical experience in this temporal, form-based realm, well, the equipment we chose is very limited. The five senses are very limited. The sensory equipment we call our eyes, well, out of the electromagnetic light spectrum, from infrared light to ultraviolet light, our physical human eyes perceive the visible light spectrum. That's it. Our ears, the sensory equipment we call our ears, well, Rover the dog, his sensory equipment actually receive more auditory information than the human ears. And I am not even going to get into the bats and the insects because it is utterly embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry. Well, I actually want to tell you that even it's even worse than that because of those of that little tiny bit that we do perceive, that little sliver, quantum physicists say that in that little sliver of information are trillions and trillions of bits of information. But this brain of ours can't receive it all. Our brains filter out almost all of it and just lock on to 
little tiny bit, maybe a thousand bits of information to make what appears to be our present moment perceptual experience. But don't worry, because there is something inside of us that is connected to the all-knowing, all-loving, infinite aspect of ourself that is who we truly are. There is something within us that is totally connected and totally one with the infallible mind of God that is in us, as us, with us, for us. We have a hotline to the divine. Does anyone, in, anyone want to know what that is? Or maybe you already know. It's the infinite, ever-expanding wisdom of our heart. So I invite you, when you ask this question of yourself, to ask your heart. Ask your hearts. And that's what I did in those several months of contemplation. I asked my heart. And I contemplated. I went into meditation, frustration, confusion, and finally I got to clarity and I got my answer. Does anyone want to know what I got? Yes. Well, the first thing I got in my contemplations was I love my dad. And I believe him. And you know what? I think he's actually, between you and I, I think he's a sage or a guru in the disguise of a regular guy. <laughs> who likes to eat steak and drink beer and ride his Harley <laughs> and cheer on the Red Sox. Woo <laughs> and he has never done anything ever in my life to not make me trust him. Number two, as I sat in contemplation, there was a time when I, my mind just got flooded with all the divine orchestration examples, real life examples in my life of divine orchestration, miracles, synchronicities, meetings. What are the chances that in 1994, when I lived in Massachusetts, that Bo and Bethy back there, who I met for one week at A Course in Miracles retreat in Wisconsin, would be driving through Las Vegas the exact same weekend that I was visiting my brother in Las Vegas. And then they happened to invite me to this very different, unknown place I had never heard of in my life to come check it out. It's called Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> Things like that. And I'm sure that all of you have many, many, just as many as not more than me, of examples of your life. <coughs> and all of you that I know and love, I, I consider every single one a holy encounter. Every single one of you as a sacred meeting. It was divinely orchestrated so that I could have a friend. Because when I came here, I had no friends. I didn't know anybody. So the bone back. And number three, the church that I went to as a child <clears throat> on most every Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, <laughs> <laughs> had no walls. It was the enchanted, fern filled forests of New England. And my Sunday school teachers were my guides and angels. And they taught me that God was everywhere and, and, and everything, always. In the chirping of the birds, in the rustling of the leaves, the sparkling of the water, the sun on the water. They told me that God was everywhere and everything, always, everyone. It's all they talked about. And then, as an early teen, I was talking to some friends, and they were talking to me about a very shady character. 
And this character was kind of against God, kind of his enemy. And they called him the devil. And I had never really heard of this concept before. My guides had never spoken of this character. So I went to my guides and each and said, who is this dude? <laughs> and they asked me these two questions. And I've asked this many times for many years to many people. And I want to ask those two questions to all of you. If you are in a pitch dark space, indoors or outdoors, and without manipulating the darkness in any way, give me some examples of sources, things that create light, will create light, physical real life things in our world that can create light into that darkened space. A match, excellent. Cigarette lighter, fantastic. Light switch, glow stick. Cell phone. Cell phone. Yourself. <laughs> Firefly. Firefly. Beautiful. We could probably go on all day. The sun, flashlights, on and on and on. <coughs> now, if you're in a brightly lit space, in, indoors or outdoors, and without manipulating the light in any way, give me some examples of sources real-life physical things that can create darkness into that brightly lit space. Closing your eyes is good, but that would be blocking out the light. Russ has got it. That would be blocking out the light, too. Russ just said it, nothing. Science defines darkness as the absence of light. Science has not found anything physical in this universe that creates or is a source of darkness. And my guides and angels use this as an analogy for me, that just like on this physical world, on the spiritual world, there is no source for darkness or hate or fear. But we can experience it when we block out that light, that all-loving presence of God, when we turn away from God, <clears throat> when we shut ourselves down from that all-loving presence that is within us, that is us. And so I decided that if there is only one source, and this source is all-loving, and it's all good, it makes perfect sense that this would be an all, everything would be a divinely orchestrated universe for all good and for all love. And then fourth, I realized that <coughs> I get to choose. We all get to choose. You see, the outer world is an exact reflection of the inner conscious, subconscious, and unconscious mind. As within, so without. In Proverbs 23.7, it says, as a man thinketh, so is he. <coughs> do you remember those trillions and trillions of bits of information that we do perceive? Of those trillions of bits, do you know how the brain actually decides which couple thousand? Our belief systems. That's why the Indians didn't see the ships coming from Europe. They only saw the breaking of the waves. It wasn't any belief systems ships. They'd never seen such a thing. There are as many belief systems on this planet as there are people. None are true and none are false. But it is certain that whatever our belief system is, <coughs> it will outmanifest exactly in exact mirror. So I decided I am fully empowered to create my reality. Okay, because I am fully empowered to choose my belief systems. And if I've got a choice in front of me up to whether to believe that this is a chaotic and fearful universe, and if I believe that, that is how it will all picture, or I can believe that this is a divinely orchestrated, synchronistic, friendly, all-loving, and kind universe, always orchestrating 
for everyone's highest and greatest good. And that's what will out picture. That's how the word will occur to me. I realized the world is not happening to me. I am the world. We all are the world. And so I'd like to conclude with a meditation. So I'd like everybody to just kindly and gently close your eyes. Silently ask yourself, if this were a divinely orchestrated universe, where everything, regardless of appearances, is always happening for the best. Could you ever worry or fear again? Silently ask yourself if everyone and everything is happening for the highest good. Could you ever blame, fault, or judge another ever again? If you knew with every fiber of your being that everyone, including yourself, and everyone is always synchronistically conspiring for the greatest good of all, could you ever judge, blame, or fault yourself ever again? Could you regret anything in your past? When you live your life with the certainty that this is a divinely orchestrated universe, you always know that you are completely safe. You experience the world as a friendly, kind, fun, and supportive place. You live a miraculous life. Every cell in your body vibrates with peace. Your life is playful, spontaneous, and free. Every moment flows with ease. You have absolute faith that you will always, always be perfectly taken care of. You are powerfully guided by your heart moment to moment. Always for something rather than against anything. You see beauty and magnificence everywhere in everyone and everything. You are surrounded by loving and supportive family and friends. And because of all this love, your heart bursts with boundless joy. Every step you take 
is a holy and sacred step. When you know absolutely within the deepest core of your being that this is a safe, friendly, all good, divinely orchestrated universe, you remember who you truly are. You are home. You are eternally free. You live in a state of constant and profound grace. Thank you.